Good afternoon. This, supposed, this was supposed to be my first talk, but I had a free paper, so I was stuck in that room. So the biomarker project, a reality. The question is, it's pretty complex to reach out here. And uh, the, the first question which comes to our mind, uh, because I know Ashwin has mentioned and a lot of my other colleagues has already mentioned about why do you need a biomarker? Uh, the answer is exactly what uh, they asked John Mallory when he was supposed to be the first person who was trying to climb Mount Everest. Why do you want to climb Mount Everest? He said, because it's there. And I believe this is one of the most famous answers ever given. It was so simple, but the most famous ever in the history of mankind. And it's written all over. And even when people asked uh, John F. Kennedy, why do you want to go to the moon? He repeated the same question. He gave the same answer. And he quoted George Mallory also. People who are interested to know about his history, it was, he was, his uh, book was romantic. Uh, book was made uh, in a more of a, uh, a story format by Jeffrey Archer, and it's called Path of Glory. And it's been one of my greatest books ever read. <laughs> the most important thing of a biomarker project, of any biomarker you do, is this uh, five steps. First is you need to hear. You need to hear, listen, and figure out what is interesting for you. Once you hear something, try to engage with people. Because anything you do, whether it's from the tears to brain, you have to have a group of people with whom you need to engage. When, when you have engagement, then you have people get involved in this. When you get involved, then you start becoming inspired in your own ideas. But this is the most critical step, because if you're not inspired with your own ideas, you'll not move forward. All these things are very easy. You hear something today, you can engage with people out here, but this part always is the step which makes it uh, very important. Because after that, you create something of a value because that value is what translates into the reality of a dream project. What is the single most important factor in a biomarker identification is the power of curiosity. If you do not have the power of curiosity, everything goes waste because that is the most critical step. And the second one is the power of observation. So when we look at any biomarker project or anything to do with identification of something, you have to have a research question. That's why I kept it blank. Research question can be anything. Why do you want to do this? And that starts the whole journey. The journey starts with genetics, create genes, information, everything else. Then you need the lab. Let me start with our uh, model. I speak from the cornea perspective. We all know the corneal layers. We all know about the anatomical layers. We know the topography. But what is interesting is when you're looking at the cellular level, you have to completely reconstruct the whole thing at the cellular component itself. That means each level, each layer is not the layer which is anatomical here. Each layer is cellular. For example, what is filled out here is tears, aqueous layer, and mucin. But what is out all here is electrolytes, proteolases, multiple stuff, which actually make the whole block of that. And what is filled in the stroma is not your collagen, not the, not the gray and white thing what you see. What you see here is filled with cellular structure. We looked at the collagen 1, type of collagen, collagen 4, the stromal layers, keratocytes, and these blue things are very important, the lysyl oxidase. So when you're looking at any biomarker project on cornea, you can actually pick up one of them. You can just say proteolysis. I would pick up, pick up on that and I'll try start studying on them. Let me look at the collagen 4, what happens in here. And that's what you start with your project. Uh, let me give two examples of this. One which starts with keratoconus. Uh, John Nottingham gave this definition 150 years back that it's a non-inflammatory disease and it's been there with us forever. The question is, is it really true? And in this today's world, do we need to change? This is the cardinal signs. We have uh, seen this, the Greek cardinal signs of inflammation. The, the heat, redness, swelling, pain, loss of function. The question is, is this what we see in the keratoconus, and is it really true? Then we look at all the parameters, and you look at, we call it an hourglass concept. Hourglass concept is you add all the multifactorial disease what you can, and see what comes out to the stem out here is the inflammation. And what does this happen? As soon as all that added, this goes and creates an effect. This is your hypothesis. You're not proven this yet. And this is what I said, you engage. And you start, once you do that, then you start working on it. So what we did was, the most important thing is not to throw out any of the tissue you remove, you remove whether you are, you are a vitreous surgeon or you are a, a refractive surgeon. 
all these tissues, whatever you collect, the tissues, uh, the, 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 the tears, the epithelium, a tremendous, uh, uh, you know, knowledge in them. And if you throw them, we pro probably would lose a lot of those knowledge. Most important thing in any of this project is, it may be just an epithelium, you're discarding it off. You may think that it may not be useful for you. But ultimately, it's patience, it belongs to him. So you need to take a consent from him that I'm using your epithelium, which otherwise I'm going to throw. And this is a consent form you need to take, and you have to register yourself in the trial. And what we collect from the tears and epithelium, we start the journey. The journey starts with collection on the tubes, you transport it at 80 degrees, send it to the laboratory which you work in, you extract what you want, in this case uh, RNA and complementary DNA synthesis, and ultimately end up with what you are looking for. You're looking for the genes. Many times we get excited when you see something, but the question is, finding out something is of no use if you do not know what it does on a tissue. That is called the ontology, and ontology is nothing but from the effect to the cause, and that is very important on whatever biomarker you do. Going back to the same model, now let's look at the tears. We found that inflammation was high. Let's skip all this thing. We found that inflammation was higher in the, both the tears and the epithelium out here. Then we go deeper. Because whatever you see in any structure, tears are like urine. You have expression of all the structures on your tears. Like in urine, you may have a lot of uh, changes. You may pick up sugar, you may pick up uric acid. Uric acid is not forming only in the kidney. You may find it from various places. So when you have all these things expressed here, you can easily pick them up and then see what is happening. So exactly, what, was, what we are trying to see is a very simple thing. The question here is, can we pick up the strength of your cornea, the cellular strength of your cornea, the cellular strength of cornea is your lysyl oxidase. And that is responsible for your collagen, uh, for your cross-linking. If the cellular structure of your cornea can it be picked up on your tears? Because you, if you pick up on tears, because this is just in mud in expression, when all this expresses on your epithelium and tears, that's what we pick up. Because identifying that also tries to help to identify your strength of your cornea indirectly. And that's exactly what we found. If you're looking at the keratoconic eyes, the tears show less of LOX activity. It means that your cornea is not as strong as it should be. And compared to the controls, and it actually goes by the grade of cornea. And this is what we published in Molecular Vision recently. And epithelium also shows the same thing. So two things we were able to prove. One is there is inflammation. The second is inflammation can be picked up by both in the tears and the epithelium. That has been done before, but this has never been done before. Trying to find the expression of factors which are present in your stroma to be picked up on your tears. And that gives us an idea that not only on this, we can try to pick up a lot of stuff, including a VEGF tomorrow from your tears. To prove what we are seeing, on the cellular level, we wanted to prove it on the, the histopath, that's the immunohistochemistry. And we stained for all this. This is from a keratoconus patients. And the lysine oxidase using a special stain stains brown. And you hardly see in any of them. And you see collagen darker strain, you see you hardly see any of them. So that means what you actually found on tears could be a potential marker is what you, what you the associated strength. Then you look at the genetic components and trying to see if they match with your uh, patients. After you get everything, you have to have a hypothesis because uh, you can't find, you can't make a judgment on this because it's, basic science will never help you to make a judgment. You need to have a hypothesis for that. So to create a hypothesis, we call it inflammaxis, which looks at the inflammation in total. You have an inflammation, you pass, if the cornea is weak, if the Bowman's is weak, the inflammation passes into your stroma. All the inflammation changes your structures completely. We know that all the inflammatory markers, what I mentioned here, on a, on a patient, on a, on, a, uh, on a cellular growth, they can change the whole structure and they cause weakening. So you, you go from one end to the other. That's why we call the bench to clinic pro process. Now you know something. Now what do you do with that? You know that it's an inflammation. So you can use drugs. We use cyclosporin in this case to see the stability. We can, you can use a new drug or you can use it as a predictor because many times we do a cross-linking, any surgery on the cornea. If you know how the strength of the cornea is, then you can actually predict the outcome. So that's again one of the issue. And we also, grew, we also use some cultured epithelial cells and we started trying to see a different kind of uh, inflammation, trying to use different antibodies to this to see if it works. And that's again the second step of it and this is the work. 
And when you use cyclosporin, it started showing a change. That means some patients do show a change when you treat the inflammation itself. So a new concept emerged that you can actually modify the keratoconus using this treatment. So to conclude, there's a chronic inflammation. This conclude this part of it. I have one more, three more slides of the second part. Uh, there is a biomarker there. There should be a potential target. And we see a lot of collagen being changed. And the limitation has to be always be clear with you because sometimes you get so carried away by your own finding that you believe that whatever you've done is, uh, is sent from God and you, you start believing it and are trying to propagate that. So limitation always has to be told that you're, you're, not, you're just a small number, cannot extrapolate into a major uh, conclusion and you need to look at a lot of factors. The future model, we just had the same concept we have uh, uh, just uh, uh, approved uh, from one uh, hospital in the US to, com to complete the same model on an animal eye because we need uh, mice which could, uh, because we, we cannot use rabbits because rabbits don't have bowmans. So <clears throat> mice is the only one which has bowmans like human beings. So we need to use the same axis because most important thing in my thing is there has to be a breach in the bowmans and we have to create a breach. To create that, we need to use that. So what do we do from here? We need to identify kits. We had to work with the companies. That's when I said engaging with the companies. And uh, there are companies which looks at the MMP9 kits, which looks like a pregnancy kit, which just look at the tiers and gives you the values. But we need to have a more panel. That's something which is in our pipeline. The second part is when you remove an epithelium, what does it tell you? Many times when you remove an epithelium, the epithelium does a lot of factors. Many times you know, it even tells you the stage of your collagen uh, 1, 4, and other things, which indirectly tells you the state of uh, uh, the effect of your cross-linking. Uh, I have just a minute more of this slide. This happened as a very interesting uh, set of patients who developed haze after PRK. Uh, it is very, because we do a lot of PRKs, but not all of them develop this kind of haze. And uh, we all know there's a very complex pathway outage which can cause haze. That is interesting, but why did this patient get haze? So the most interesting part of this was I had collected the epithelium of this patient one year before and we were stored in our uh, lab when the patient had come for just a PRK. So all I had to do is just go back to those epitheliums of those patients and we collect everything. That is the most important thing in a biomarker project is do not discard anything if you want to do a project because that is going to be a gold mine for you in the future. And because I had this patient's epithelium, we were able to go back and look at all these things. I just put this to impress you, hardly know any one of it. Somebody has taken pains to do it and I can just, I don't know how somebody could type all this or this come, must be some kind of print and uh, just to impress you. But what we actually found here is interesting. Is there has been a pathway called an Indian hedgehog pathway. Uh, it's nothing to do with Indian, it's nothing to do with hedgehog, only the person who invented it, he loved a character of, uh, in a cartoon character called Hedgehog, and when he found this, he just put it up. So that's why it's called a Hedgehog. So it's nothing to do with anything to do with the, the Hedgehog on any, any aspect of it. It's just a cartoon character out here. What is important here is this has been a very interesting finding in many atherosclerosis and many cardiac diseases. It's a new concept which is emerging. If you re really look into the papers of all this, you will find that this pathway actually causes a lot of change. And because we had the epithelium of a patient when he was normal, and we had collected the epithelium, we were able to unlock this whole pathways. And this pathway, we, we, we had to cross-check with whether the other patients who underwent, so we looked at more than 200 patients going undergoing PRKs, and we could not find this. So you can find something completely novel on this thing, and we, we, we now look, now we found this, we start looking for this in all patients who go for it. We don't know how to actually uh, modulate this, we treat the same the patient as it is, but we can find something very interesting sometime. Uh, also, uh, people who are uh, uh, seen a smile surgery, the smile, we remove the lenticule, we don't burn it, we remove and throw it off, and uh, it's such a useful uh, lent, uh, tissue for research. And what I've been doing is we've been using it to, we can take the same lenticule, take it to the lab, you can grow the, uh, uh, you can do a lot of stromal studies, you can grow keratocytes, you can use a lot of inflammation on it because it's a living tissue. You collect it on a MK medium and you can, multiple things can be done. So virtually throwing tissue in a research uh, when you're actually trying to work on research is something I call it as a biggest the grave mistake with what we do. I believe the biorepository is going to be the future. 
if you want to do anything, you have to have a biorepository of everything, whether you're operating on a glaucoma or retina. Just go for it. It's out there. Thank you.